Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to our last midweek Bible study for, um, well, until August, and then we'll get started again. The um, I've got a few things. We have a relative of um, Miss Barbara's that we want to pray for, uh, lives in another state, uh, actually down in Louisville, and he's uh, took a bad fall. He's an octogenarian and uh, broke a bunch of ribs. So we want to uh, pray for him because obviously he needs some healing. We want to pray for Miss Pamela as well. Miss Pam is, um, she, she is really recovering from a broken wrist that she had and it didn't heal right. So she got operated on yesterday and she's doing pretty well, but um, she is in a lot of pain, she told me today. She said, man, she said, pray for me tonight. I am in a lot of pain. I said, you're kidding. She said, no. She said, it is, it's just really, really hurting. I said, all right, well, we, we will definitely be praying for you then and uh, believing that the Lord is going to just relieve you of all of that pressure and uh, you can get back where you ought to be. Um, so let's pray for her as well. And we still need to keep praying for our nation. I mean, we are going through some stuff. And, and I want to tell you, we're going through stuff that we need to wake up to. Believers need to wake up to. And, uh, and we need to really take a look at what the Lord is doing uh, in the body of Christ. Because it, it isn't just about, uh, you know, praying for people and saying, oh, we want this stuff to end. There are forces at work to fundamentally change how we look at everything. And, I mean, what's up is down and what's down is up and what's left is right. And, and so we want to pray that the Lord grabs a hold of the United States and all the people here, and we begin to see a whole different look at, um, at our country, because we it's okay to be old, the old-fashioned stuff. It's okay to have the stuff the way things used to be, uh, as far as morality and all that. Yeah, we want all the good stuff, but we want, we want our purpose and our attitudes to still be Christ-like, like we once were. So let's pray, and then we'll get into a, a really good lesson tonight. I think you can get a lot out of. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord, we pray tonight, Father, for Pam's hand, Father, for that wrist to heal, for her not to have uh, a lot of pain in it. Father, we just pray that you give her peace and comfort, and Father, a very speedy recovery that her bones heal right this time. And we thank you, Father, for We thank you for touching her. Father, and for Barb's relative, Lord God, we pray for him. Father, it's hard to break anything, but when you're 80 plus years old, it's really difficult. So we pray, Father God, that you mend him up. Give him a supernatural touch, Lord God, that he understands what is the breadth and the height and the depth of your love for him. And Lord God, that he would heal up faster than 80-year-old people are supposed to heal up. Father, show him your goodness and show him your best. And we thank you for it. Father, right now, we pray for our country. We pray, Lord God, for all the people of this United States. Father, we pray, Lord, that there would be an awakening, an awakening deep inside of the body of Christ, an awakening, Lord God, that would, would shake the foundations of this country. Lord God, so that the things that have uh, that are destroying people's homes and their their cities, Lord God, that those things would be uh, seized by your goodness and by your grace, Father, that your mercy would be poured out, Father, that the hearts of the people would turn back to God, that they would turn back to you, Lord God, that they would turn to Jesus, and Father, that all this other foolishness would go away. And Lord God, we do pray for a unity of the body of Christ in the United States with all the different churches, Lord God, all the different denominations, Father, having one purpose and one mind and one heart, Father, and that is that the body of Christ would be unified and stand strong and not back down and not bow down, Lord God, to terrorists inside or outside. Father, we thank you and we praise you, Lord God, that you're giving us strength to speak out boldly about the grace and the love of Jesus Christ. 
Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. Give us a great lesson tonight. Help us, teach us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Everybody here okay tonight? I hope so. Our, our, our crowd is kind of thinned out over the last couple of weeks, and I know we've got a lot of people on vacation um, and going different places. Hey, Michael. Hola. Let's get started because we're going to take a look here at the actual time that Moses begins to get the commandments from God. There's there's some interesting conversation here that we need to pay attention to. Exodus chapter 19, verses 10 and 11. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow, and let them wash their clothes, and let them be ready for the third day. And on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. Boy, when I was reading this, you know, as you're going through Scripture, especially the Old Testament, you read through stuff, you know, and if you've read it a few times, um, or maybe many dozens of times, and, you know, everybody's got their favorite books, and you, you, you kind of get reading through them, and you just don't see things. Anybody else like that, or is it just me? You just don't see stuff, you know, and when you when you just stop and you start looking for things, you start discovering all kinds of things that you you thought weren't even in the Bible. And um, this is one of those verses. Exodus 19, the Lord's getting ready to talk to Moses. He's getting ready to. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, he's getting ready to. Give him the goods as far as the law goes. And he um, he says here, the Lord says to Moses, go to the people, consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes. Now, here's the part that I just kind of blew over in reading. Let them be ready for the third day. Anybody know anything, any other just maybe slightly important thing that happened on the third day? Well, you guys got to get faster fingers tonight. Uh, for on the third day, the Lord will come down from Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. This is a picture of when Jesus went three days into the belly of the earth to cleanse, uh, to cleanse all of us. Um, in this, it is on the people to cleanse themselves. But in our salvation... It is the Lord who declares our cleansing. This is the exact opposite. Here God comes down. In the time that Jesus was here, Jesus went up. So in, in one instance, we, got, we have God coming down to meet with men on Mount Sinai. In the other circumstance, we have Jesus going up to meet with God. Either way, Mount Sinai is involved because it's involved in just about everything that happens in Judaism. And, and we see here a, a real picture of Jesus and what he does for the people. Now, this goes on, and there's some really interesting parts to this whole thing. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Now, this is when God goes and meets. He, he's, that, he's on the mountain. He descends. He's there for three days. On the third day, there's thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud. You might remember on the day that Jesus died, there were thunders and lightnings in a thick cloud. It said that it was so dark, it was utter darkness, which means darkness where you can't see your hand in front of your face. In fact, God shielded Jesus really from the view of everybody. And he did that so that he could lay all of his chastisement upon him because it says that God chastened him with all of it. I mean, all of his uh, all of his fury was poured out on Jesus. And Jesus took it all for us. That's how he conquered sin. Now, 
We also know that Jesus went to the top of a mount. He was crucified there. God comes down to the top. Jesus goes from there up to God. So we, we've got the picture and we've got the reverse. It's like when the law comes in, 3,000 people die. When the spirit comes in, 3,000 people get born again. It's how God does things. Now take a look at Genesis 20, 18 through 21. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. You talk about a day. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to people, do not fear, for God has come to test you. Now, that's important. You might want to underline that if you have your Bible there. God has come to test you. And that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So the people stood afar off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Now, think about this. All of this is happening, and God says, I'm here to test you. Well, what, what do you think he's testing them about? I mean, they came to the mountain. They've agreed that God is going to be their God. They did say, tell us what we need to do, and, and we'll do it. And yet here is God, and God, God says, I'm going to test you. That's what he told Moses. Hey, and Moses is telling people, hey, don't fear. Don't you understand? God's come here to test you. Think about the, the phrase where it talks about faith and fear. Whatever's without faith is sin. God is coming down. He's told these people all about himself. He, he's, he's put the word out there but to Moses. He's told them, hey, I, I want you to love me. I want you to hear attentively to what I'm saying. I, I want you to, I want to be your God and I want you to be my people. And I want us to have this great relationship. And he comes down with all the smoke and lightning and thundering and everything else. And the people are scared. And Moses says, don't be afraid. God's come to test you. Well, what is he testing them in? Mike says obedience. Anybody else have, have any other, um, any other idea? I'm on. I can't believe with all you folks online tonight that none of you are jumping in and, and doing any quick typing. All right. How about this? God is testing them to see if, he, if they believe what they've learned about him. He, he's testing them to see if they fear him. Yeah, Mike, the faith is part of the fear that we should have because of the, the respectful fear, right? Only they're not in respectful fear here. They're trembling. They're trembling as if they don't believe anything that God has just said to them about who he is and what he's willing to do for them. So he comes down, lightnings and thunderings. Now, I'm not saying that that, that I just walk up to the mountain and, and climb up there and say, we're going to go up and see who this is. No, because God told him very plainly, stay down there because you touch the mountain, you're dead, right? But what he is telling them, it, think, of the, think of the phrase, yet yeah, might they were, exactly. They were thinking with a carnal mind. Think of the phrase, come boldly to the throne of grace. What does God want for his people to do when they pray? Does he want them coming cowardly, begging uh, in fear, uh, you know, as is, is if they don't know that God even wants to, to answer their, their prayer or that God wants to uh, do anything for them? Is, I mean, is that the thinking that the body of Christ has? I, I know in some churches that's kind of pretty much what it was, but that's, that's not who God is. And that's the point he's trying to make here. And that's why Moses tells him that. Yeah, I mean, you don't see Moses trembling and, and you know, crawling up the side of the mountains and it won't look up. Moses walks right on up there. God says, come up, Moses. God says, okay, I'm your friend. I'm coming up. What did Jesus say to his disciples? You're my friends. Yeah, he wants people to speak boldly and in faith. Absolutely. 
which means they have to believe his word. He told them what he was going to do. He told them what he was coming down for. And now they've got a, an opportunity where God appears before them for three days and all they can do is, is, is shake and quiver. And, and maybe, you know, maybe this would have been a good time for them to come to the front of the mountain and begin to, to shout and worship and exalt him. Instead, they're telling him, Moses, Moses, listen, tell God not to talk to us. Please tell God not to. You talk to us. We, you're a man. We can deal with you. But just tell God not to talk to us. Yeah, exactly, Joyce. We don't need to grovel. We, we can stand and, and look at him. He, he tells us over and over, look up. Your redemption draws nigh. He doesn't say look down. In fact, the scripture teaches teaches us we ought not to be looking down. Take a look here, Exodus uh, 22 through 25, 20, 22 through 25. Then the Lord said to Moses, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, you have seen that I have talked with you from heaven. You shall not make anything to be with me. Gods of silver or gold, gods of gold, you shall not make for yourselves. An altar of earth you shall not make for me. You shall make for me, pardon me, you shall make for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you and I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone, you shall not build it out of hewn stone. For if you use your tool on it, you have profaned it. Now, yeah, that's exactly what, you know, what this is implying. Moses is a friend of God. And God says to him, I speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. He called Abraham friend. He, he spoke to Abraham face to face. And Jesus calls us friends. And Jesus speaks to us face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Here... He's telling uh, Moses is telling or God's telling Moses, you're going to make me an altar of earth. Don't make something out of you and stone. In other words, don't go and you make something you want me to have. Seem to remember um, that there were two guys that were going to sacrifice and one of them brought the sacrifice he wanted. God wasn't very happy with him. Cain. Well, that's the same premise here. God doesn't want what you're able to bring, the, 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 the hewn stone. In other words, you use your tools on it. You created it. God says, listen, I'm coming down to be with you. Make me an altar of earth. Use just creek rock if you're going to use rock. But just build it with, with what I've made, not with what you're able to put together. I'm not impressed with you. And And... Now, some people say, well, man, God's got a big head. He's, he's impressed with himself. He ought to be impressed with himself. He, he built the whole thing. Exodus 23, 20 through 33. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Now, pay attention to this angel. Pay attention to the angel here. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For my name is in him. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and Jebusites. And I will cut them off. Now, who do you suppose this angel is? Who do you think this angel is? Where in the scripture is there ever a place? Yeah, Jesus. Where is there ever a place where he says he puts his name into an angel? That this, um, this phrase where he says, for my name is in him. My name is in him. Remember, Old Testament times in the, the, the meanings of names, 
names were not just something that you just, you know, that's a dog or that's a cat, you know, type thing. Names actually depicted the character and the person that the name, the name brought all that out. It was a representation of everything that that person was. So God gives us his name, right? Well, if, if his name is in him, this is an extremely special person because that means if his name is in him, that means he's in him. So here we have an appearance of Jesus where God actually tells him, my angel, Jesus, is going to go before you. The Old Testament um, writers uh, or the rabbis that would make commentary on the Old Testament, on the law and stuff, uh, they they would sit and they, man, they would just pour through this thing. In their writings, you find where uh, they believed, they believed this was the spirit of Messiah. This was the spirit of Messiah. And not not an ordinary angel, not a Michael or a Gabriel or or one of them. This this was not an ordinary angel. This was a messenger of the character and the person of God. He wouldn't leave that up to an angel. It's, that's Jesus' job. Now, let's go on in the, with these verses. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water. I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. I will send my fear before you. I will cause confusion among the people to whom you, you come and will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. Wow. Think about the boldness of God with this. Look at what he, he is promising these people. Look at what he's promising them. So you shall serve the Lord your God. How? By just following, just following what he says, right? And he says, I'm going to bless your bread and your water. So your provision is going to be provided. I'm going to take sickness away from you. And from out of the midst of you, it's not even going to be near you. Sickness isn't even going to be near you. What? I mean, think about that. In this day and age, there were plagues, there were diseases, there was all kinds of stuff. There were lepers in the land even at the time. And and here God is, is saying, he's great word, Mike, completing. He, he is going to complete his blessing upon them with supernatural provision, bread and water. Sickness and disease is going to be taken away from us. Then he says, none of your ladies, no one is going to miscarry or even be barren. You're going to be fruitful. Back in that day, if you if you were barren, if a woman could not produce children or if a man couldn't produce children, women got the blame for everything back then. Sorry, ladies. But back then, if, if that were true, it meant that you had sinned against God. If you were a Hebrew, it meant you had sinned against God. For those outside of Hebraism, it, then that was a curse. It meant that there was something wrong with them. It was a curse. It was the greatest blessing in the world was to bear children. And, and to reproduce life, whether you were in uh, Judaism or out of Judaism, it didn't make any difference. Uh, a woman was particularly blessed if she could bear a, a, a lot of children. Um, very much opposite of today, right? Now, now everybody's trying to find a way of not having children. Uh, back then, if, if you bore children, you were blessed. If you couldn't bear children, then that meant you were cursed or you had done something wrong. In fact, a man was allowed to divorce his wife because she couldn't produce children for him. 
And obviously they, they weren't checking the guy out. I mean, there were, I'm sure there were guys just like there is today that were not fertile. And, you know, it, it didn't make any difference. So a guy could divorce his wife because she couldn't bear children for him. And the Lord tells them he's going to send his fear to all the other nations. You think God ain't got it together? Look at verse 28. And I will send hornets before you, which will, shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, the Hittites from before you. I will not drive them out from before you in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the fields become too numerous for you. Little by little, I will drive them out from before you until you have increased and you inherit the land. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the Sea Phil Philistia and from the desert to the river. I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. Now, yeah, Hannah did pray to God for her to have a child. Um, for him to do service, exactly. And, and, it, uh, and it all happened. God, I mean, God would release the, the wombs that were closed for women all the time. Notice he puts an emphasis on this increase part again. And I find this fascinating because I had never thought about that. God's going to send hornets. I don't know if they were a Chinese killer or murdering hornets or whatever, but he sends hornets before the children of Israel to drive out, to bother the inhabitants of the land, right? They're going to drive, drive them out. But he said, I'm going to do it. I never picked up on this before until I, I was reading through this. And I went, wow, he's going to drive them out a little at a time. He's not going to just go in and just throw everybody out of this land and say, here you go, guys. Because he said, there's a lot of uh, critters in the land. They're going to start multiplying and they may overwhelm you and you'll be able, not be able to get rid of them. So I'm going to drive them out a little at a time because right now they're controlling the critter population. They're controlling the ground. They're tilling the, the soil, making it fertile and all those things. So I'm as you increase, I'm going to move your borders back and I'm going to take you all the way until you have all the land I promised you. I never realized God even did that. I mean, think about that. He had a very scientific approach to this whole thing to ensure Israel's ultimate success. What does he do with the believer today? You know, people get saved and, and, I mean, I, I know we are, we're kind of fast-tracking everything, but people get saved, and they want everything right off the bat. They just want it all. Well, how about if as you increase, you get a little bit more and a little bit more, a little more understanding, a little more understanding. You don't get it all at one time, but as you're able to handle it, you get more. God has always worked that way, and that's exactly how Christians ought to work. Verse 32, you shall make no covenant with them, nor with their gods. They shall not dwell in your land, lest they make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. In, in this lengthy promise that God gives them to deliver the promised land to the nation, to the whole nation of Israel, first of all, he says, listen, I'm going to bother them. I'm going to set you up so that you take them and drive them out. It's not me. I'm not going to do it. You're going to. You need to do this. God does the same thing with us. You got a problem, God? I mean, God will remove some things. Yeah, because we, we need them. We'll get some miracle deliverances here and there. But for the most part, what God does with all of us is God teaches us a step at a time, line upon line, precept upon precept. And he teaches us to how we can overcome, how we can uh, we can begin to push back the boundaries that have kept us in a box or or taken things out of our life, where God is saying, "Listen, I want you to keep pushing. I want you to keep going forward. I want you to learn by faith. And as you overcome one thing, you'll grow and you'll be stronger, and you'll take on the next thing and the next thing." It's how God started with Israel. Israel is a picture of the body of Christ. God places conditions on Israel's success 
at taking the land, though. He tells them how he wants them to do it. He also lays conditions on that they're not going to uh, cohabit with the the uh, people and their gods. He doesn't care if he's okay with the, if they're okay with the people. He's going to drive them out anyway. He doesn't want them messing with these other gods. And he wants to know, are they going to keep his word or not? Will they fall to the idols that the other nations have when they go in to possess their land? And they start seeing all these idols and they hear the stories, how they bowed and worshiped at this, you know, this rock and that tree and this stump of wood. And, and this God showed up for him and that God showed up for him. Is Israel going to bow and forget their God? Is there a new New Testament similarity to idols or gods? Do we get any instruction in that? Oh yeah, Paul warns us, doesn't he? Paul warns us about it. God wants to be everything. That's all he ever wanted to be for Abraham. That's all he ever wanted to be for Moses. That's all he ever wanted to be for the nation of Israel. He wanted to be their total source of spirituality, uh, joy, peace, comfort, everything. God wanted to be their source. It isn't anything different with Jesus. As New Testament believers, we have an obligation to look to God for everything, to, to consider him to be our source. Yeah, it, that's that's right. Mike says, either you believe that you have the authority through his son, Jesus, or, or you don't. So many people, especially in this day and age, where we are socially correct, politically correct, we're correct in so many ways, we're, we're always afraid to offend people, and we end up offending God. Listen, God can deal with our stuff, but we'll never have what God has intended us to have if we don't begin to straighten our backbones up and understand who he created us to be. And he didn't create us to be worms, to be smashed under feet. God created us to be powerful and loving and caring and that we would conquer the world through love and grace. And there's a power in that. We know there's a power in it. We know in this country there's a power in it. Now, take a look at 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion is light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever in what agreement has the temple of God with idols. You are the temple of the living God. I mean, Paul just lays it out for it. Now, when he says this thing, don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. This is a military term um, used for informing the troops not to break ranks. This, I mean, I, I know we've, if you've pastored, you've used this verse to try and discourage somebody from getting married to an unbeliever. And that isn't what this verse is talking about. It, it's, it's not talking about in being unequally yoked together in a marriage relationship. This is talking about don't be unequally yoked together with anybody who doesn't believe the word of God. Now, just give you an example of that. People who are spirit-filled, people who, who pray in tongues, people who believe that God still does miracles, that uh, things still happen today, that God's still involved, and they, they align themselves up with people who don't believe that there are any gifts of the Spirit, don't believe there is even a Holy Spirit other than he's this still small voice on the inside of you that whispers in your ear at night. I can tell you what happens most of the time. The Spirit-filled believers knock everything down. You know, they kind of push everything down so that they're not offensive 
to the people who haven't experienced a spirit-filled life. I've seen churches do it. I've seen people do it. And and I'm not saying go out and just, you know, it, you start talking to somebody. I've seen this too, and it's berserk. So you start talking to somebody and you can't speak English while you're talking to them because, you know, you're a spirit-filled Christian and you want to make sure they know it. That's That's the complete other side of things. But I'm talking about using the, the position that God has taken you and put you in as a person filled with the Spirit of Christ, as a person with the Word of God inside of you, and having boldness to speak that Word, boldness to stand in the different circumstances of life, boldness to worship together with people as you would worship at your own home church or in, in your worship closet or wherever it is that you get with God. And that's what Paul is addressing here. He's saying, don't lock yourself up with people who don't believe what the word of God says. Because you can't have communion light with darkness. You can't have righteousness and lawlessness in the same pot. or Christ and and the devil in the same pot. He, he's not telling us not to talk to unbelievers, not to associate with unbelievers. In fact, he's telling us the complete opposite. He's telling us to get out there and get with the unbelievers, but don't become like the unbelievers. Get out there, just, just like he told the children of Israel. When you go into this land, listen, I'm going to go before you. I'm going to send hornets. It, believe me, they're going to want to leave. You go in and you take the land. Be who you are supposed to be. Have the boldness of the of the nation that I, I, I grabbed hold of and took to myself. Have that boldness as you go forward. Sad to say, we've lost a little bit of spunk since the book of Acts. And, and maybe it's time the church starts waking up. Maybe it's time the, the church starts taking a different look in a different direction of things. This is maybe a bad term, but we got to quit being weenies. You know what I mean? Let's check the rest of this verse out. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Yeah, that's it. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and my daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Paul here is quoting uh, from the Old Testament, and, and he's actually taken a couple of different verses from different sections of, uh, I believe, Leviticus and, and uh, Numbers and putting them together. In this quote, we find Paul telling us, hey, God's telling us he will dwell with us. What did Jesus say? I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. I'm, I'm never going to leave you. I'm never going to forsake you. I'm going to be with you all the time. That's why Paul is constantly instructing Timothy and Titus and all the rest of them. Don't be in fear. It is your enemy. There have been a lot of um, a lot of people stoking the embers of fear in the last several months, whether it's a virus or riots or whatever the case is. A lot of people have been stroking the embers of fear, and it's, there is no time to fear for us as believers. Instead, we ought to be encouraged because we can look up, knowing that all these things are prophesied and all these things are going to come to pass. And yet we're still waiting for Jesus. So Paul gives us the prophetic word and tells us, listen, we're the ones that are going to have Christ in us, the hope of glory. Why do you think Paul has all the strong language? I mean, he's, he's really hitting it here. Why does he have such strong language when it comes to idols? Yeah, fear will flee. When you stand up, fear will flee. Are, are idols really a problem today, or do we even know what an idol is anymore? 
I mean, it used to be it was a stump, it was a rock, it was a picture or something, you know, it was a bird, an animal. Now it's people, right? We got all kinds of people idols. And I suppose we have maybe government idols too and work idols and things we'd like to be like. Paul says we don't need any of that stuff. It's what God was telling Israel to begin with. Listen, this is your biggest fear when you go in against these people. They're going to have these gods, and they're going to try and convince you that this God got them rain. This God got their got their their crops to grow. This God did this. This God did that. None of that happened. I will be your complete and total deity for everything in your life. Don't fall for any of this stuff. And yet in this day and age, we still do. The play on words here helps us understand the seriousness of not just believing in the saving of the soul, but also moving on to a holy moral lifestyle. When he's talking about coming out from among them and being separate, this is certainly not assigning the believer to a boring life without opportunity for fun by any means. Everybody doesn't need to be running around in in a Christian uniform. The word touch here is a Greek word meaning to not cling to. When, he, when he's saying don't touch the unclean thing, he, he's not saying don't, don't just put your finger on it. He's saying don't cling to it. Don't grab hold of it and hang on to it. It brings with it the sense of not making yourself dependent on anything. And that's really the, the meaning of the word. Don't touch the unclean thing. Don't become dependent on the thing that can't help you. You say, well, what, what's unclean? What isn't good for your life? What, what is detrimental to your faith? What takes you to a place where you're not operating in faith? Now, this receive, when he says, I will receive you, it, it's a term implying taking one into your favor. The moral life of faith brings us or brings with it a realization of the Lord's favor. If you're all the time encumbered with with stuff, now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say even you know like sin the sins. I'm not even gonna say encumbering your life with these sins that we we seem to want to point out all the time. I'm not even talking about that. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Mike. What what is it that takes away from God? If you encumber your life with things to take away from the Lord? Listen, Paul says, what what soldier gets ready for battle but encumbers himself again with the things of life? No, he's going to go out because he's got a job to do. He, He may not come home, so he's got to be focused on that. Or he won't come home, right? He He says... What, what Paul is, is telling us here is that if we will keep focused on the things of God, if we'll keep focused on the things that the Lord has for us, we will be in better shape if we're not messing with all of our sin, if we're not messing with a bunch of failure, we're not messing with depression and this and that and the other thing. We will be in much better shape to grab hold of and see the blessings that are all around us. A, f- a friend of mine uh, came to the United States from Jamaica, and he uh, he literally came over without a pair of shoes. He he got on a boat from Jamaica to the United States, and and he came here without any shoes on his feet. He was a teenager, an older teenager at the time, and uh, when he got here, he could not believe at the opportunity all around him to make money. And today he's very well off. And I was at, talking to him one day about it. And I, I said, well, I heard you say that in a testimony. Explain what you're, what you're talking about. And he said, well, I, I saw so many people here in the United States. And they were telling me how they couldn't make any money, how they couldn't get a job, how they couldn't produce, how they couldn't do this and couldn't do that. He said, I came over here and I saw nothing but opportunity. This whole country is just a grand opportunity for anybody and everybody. We all have an opportunity. 
if we see things from God's end, if we look for the blessings instead of the cursings, if we look for the, the place where God is instead of where he isn't, it, and, and that's why Paul tells us, to stay away from the idols. Stay away from these unclean things. Don't touch them. Don't cling to something that's going to come in the place of God to you, that you'll eventually take that, and, and that'll take precedence over God in your life. When we take the, the opportunity to look for the opportunities that God has laying before us, all of a sudden, you know, the, the worst marriage in the world turns into the best. The worst kids in the world turn into the best. The, the worst job in the world turns into something that you, you flourish in. God can do all kinds of things if you will begin to look with eyes like he looks. And he looks through everything with eyes of grace. That's what he was trying to get Israel to understand when he told them, listen, I'm going to set you up for success. I'm going to send hornets before you to drive out the inhabitants of this land. But you're going to have to drive them out. You're going to have to go in there and make it happen. When we see that Jesus is right there with us, because that's what God said Jesus would do. He said, my angel is going to go before you. He's going to make this thing easy for you. You just have to go in and do it. Take a look at Exodus 24, 9 through 10. Then Moses went up, also Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. I don't remember reading this either. I thought just Moses went up, just uh, Joshua went up, and, and saw the things that were happening on the mountain. But, he, but here, Nadab, Abihu, Aaron, Moses, 70 of the elders of Israel, man, this changes the whole thing about, man, this calf, just, I just threw this gold. I, we took off our earrings, threw them in the fire, and out comes this calf. I just, we just can't believe it. How did it happen? You know, uh, this puts new light in this because these guys knew who he was. They knew who God was. I think if we get an opportunity to see who Jesus is, we really need to look toward the favor. Recognize it. Look at Exodus 24, 12. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there. And I will give you tablets of stone and the law and commandments, which I have written, that you may teach them. Now, up to this point, the Lord had only spoken to Moses but has not given him any written law. He was instructed, he, he had instructed them to listen and even wrote a book of the covenant. Moses did. Moses wrote all the stuff the Lord told him down. God didn't give him anything that God wrote. But now this thing's going to be written with the finger of God and tablets of stone. Why do you think God took the drastic step of, put, of writing it in stone? I mean, that's an expression we use. Uh, it's not cast in stone yet. You know, that means it's still changeable, right? But man, once it's cast in stone, it, it ain't getting any different. It's going to be what it is, right? Here, God had told them already everything, but he hadn't put it in the stone yet. He was making things concrete. <laughs> He hadn't done that yet. He, he hadn't put it in stone. And, and you know what's amazing is every time you, you find this, if you read in all the other places, all places that I skipped for you, go back and read this story. You find the children of Israel saying it over and over again. Well, tell us what we need to do. Tell us what we need to do. Well, yeah, we can do that. We can do this. We can do that. They're, they're always claiming some type of uh, high ground here where they can do everything, knowing I think they really knew in their heart they couldn't. So here God puts it in stone. Okay, listen, everybody's in agreement now. Let's put it in stone. Do you ever wonder if one guy, just one guy would have said, hey, wait a minute. I I don't think asking God to do all this stuff, you know, and, and put these laws down in stone is a good idea. Well, we, we might not be able to keep that how about if we just let him be God for a while? How, 
How about that? I mean, they had the opportunity. They have his servant, the angel of God, Jesus, the the pre-incarnate one, walking before them, going to do everything that's possible so that they can be successful. And, And they still aren't getting it, what God's asking. And yeah, it is true, Richard. If we ask, it, we, we have to have Jesus. Nobody comes to the Father except for by him, only through him. And once we come to him, once we come to Jesus, now now we're, we're seeing face to face. And now we begin to really understand who God is. Exodus 24, 16 through 17. Now the Lord... Now, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called out to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. The sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. Notice it doesn't say it was. It was like that in their eyes. Take a look at Hebrews, though, 12, 28 through 29. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. That's that reverence, Mike, you were talking about before. It's the reverence that we need. It's it's an honor to be with him. Um, Yeah, God did write those Ten Commandments so we can see them for ourselves. But yet he says... From even back then, the prophetic word was that he would write them on our heart. It was always about getting it on our heart. It was never about having a commandment to follow. It was always about God's people having ears to hear and it being on their heart. He says, for our God is a consuming fire. That's what the Hebrews thought. God's a consuming fire. Don't mess with God. And yet they did all the time. Take a look at Deuteronomy 4, 23 through 24. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. And make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. This really speaks to God's, um, God's thought process when it comes to us where he wants to be. Seek the kingdom of heaven first, the kingdom of God first. And all of these things will be added to you. God just wants to be first. And he's making that very, very clear. But he gives us this picture from Isaiah, which I I think is a much nicer way of seeing God, because this is really who he wants us to see. Isaiah 6, 1 through 7. In the year that King Uzziah died, the I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each had, each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of the one who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said... Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He's seeing Jesus too. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Now, if God is a consuming fire, then he is a consuming fire when it comes to sin. He is a consuming fire when it comes to all the things that destroy mankind. If God is a consuming fire, then he is a consuming fire that wants to consume that which pulls mankind down. Now, here we see Isaiah, who is an Old Testament character. He still doesn't see, and men don't see unless they have Jesus. Without Jesus, we are doomed, 
or mankind is doomed to see God and, and they will see him when he returns as a consuming fire, as a God who's coming down to punish, as a God who's coming down here to wipe out the earth, as a God who's coming down to, to take vengeance on all those who laughed at him and all those things. But with Jesus, you see who God really is. I mean, think of the majesty and the glory that was there in that temple uh, when, when Isaiah went in there. And he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And, and when they, the angels started crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that instead of Isaiah joining in with it maybe or, or saying, yes, he is, he, he, he begins to shake and he begins to say, I'm, I'm undone, I'm unclean, and what am I going to do? I've, you know, my eyes are going to burn out because I've seen the Lord. And, and an angel comes over to him and gently takes a, a coal from the fire. It doesn't burn his lips, but it removes his sin. It's all part of Jesus. You see, God has set us up from the beginning. And the scriptures tell us that Israel is an example to us. Everything that they did, everything they experienced were examples to us. For us to understand who God is, what his modus operandi is, how, how he operates, what he does, what he believes, what he believes about us. You don't find God hating Israel. You find God loving Israel. You find God loving Israel all the time. He, he never forsakes Israel. And, and that's what he has done with Jesus for us. He's never forsaking us. He's never leaving us alone. And he wants us to, for once to begin to understand who he's created us to be. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. Listen, yeah, God does consume e evil and, and he replaces it with mercy and grace. Absolutely. That's who he is. That's his character. That, that's everything that he put in the embodiment of Jesus Christ. Well, let's pray, and then we'll see you guys on Sunday, um, and we'll, we'll get back to Bible study in August. Um, we'll take off for the rest of June and then uh, through the month of July. Got a lot of people on vacations and all that, especially with everybody pushing, pushing vacations further and further back. So uh, we, I know we haven't seen each other that much, but uh, we're going to have a great summer. And I believe you're going to be a soul winner. You're going to bring people to Jesus. Our church is going to fill up with people who are hungry for a word from heaven. And they're going to see the, the, the character and the person of the Lord Jesus in us, in our body, and in, in, in our church. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. Father, I ask you right now, Lord God, take your people, the people who are called by your name, Lord God, let them look up. Let them look up, Lord God, and see how amazing, how wonderful, how incredible you are to them. And Father, the good things that you have stored up for them so that, Lord, they, they have minds and hearts to believe who they are in Christ. Father, and that they will have boldness. Father, boldness to speak your word, boldness to pray, boldness to worship, boldness, Lord God, to witness and to tell other people about Jesus. Father. We know that Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's holy. He's righteous. He is our healer. He is our provider. We thank you for him, Lord God. We give you praise and glory and honor. Protect your people, Lord God, as they go about this life. Father, protect them from any kind of injury, any kind of harm, any kind of sickness, disease. Wipe that away from us, Lord God. Let us be testimonies of health and wholeness and healing. And we thank you and we give you praise for it in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Listen, you all have a great week, what's left of it. And we will see you Sunday. Come ready to worship. Come ready to, to have a good time. Y'all be blessed. Bye-bye.